Yeah, we really don't have a prepared opening statement except to say that um, you know the we take audits like this very seriously. And uh, in my 16 years of uh, being part of the district office downtown here and being part of audits, uh, this one um, is unlike no one I've ever seen in the past. And uh, the the way it was conducted, the outcome of it, and the timing of its release uh, are all of concern. And uh, really in the spirit of transparency, we are here to answer whatever questions you might have. You know, you say that uh, you're suspect of some of it. Are you suspect of some of the findings? And if so, what in particular? Well, I think, uh, first of all, when we, we started out with this particular audit, you know, we had an exit conference in October. And this exit conference in October was very positive. In fact, the auditor remarked that when we asked, uh, we asked about how do we compare in, across the state. And the auditor said, this is one of the best districts in the state of Florida. And so uh, we were very happy with the outcome. March, it also appeared as if we were still going to have a positive outcome. And uh, once word of that kind of leaked out, it wasn't very uh, much longer after that that we had three anonymous phone calls that were made up to the auditor's office, office and then this thing started to go south. Um, I think that all of that and the time it took, and then suddenly for this to uh, emerge in here it is, you know, almost October, is, is not just a coincidence. Um, the findings that came afterwards, you know, the, the first three findings in particular, are the ones that, that we have the most problem with. Um, I think that that was not a part of the original audit in terms of uh, something that they found, um, you know, exception to. And, um, and then it wasn't even a part not all of it was even a part of the anonymous calls that went went up to the auditor's office. Uh, they decided to reopen the piece with impact fees. Yeah, and so, um, again, none of that made any sense to us. And, and what I've seen, like I said, over the last 16 years, I've never seen an audit like this. I've never. And um, so it, it's highly unusual and, and problematic for me. You say that you question the timing of it, but that doesn't change the findings in the audit. What's your response to that? Well, my response is, is we take exception to many of the findings. For example, the first three findings, um, you know, the district definitely disagrees with the outcome. So, yes, I mean, I can't change the, I can't change what their findings are, but I don't believe, uh, nor do I accept the find in several of the findings, particularly the first three. Concerning the um, first one in the impact fees, it says you can use it only in a way that benefits the people who pay it. So in what way did paying that debt benefit the people who are paying those fees? So uh, as it relates to that question and that finding, so the impact fees and how the people who are paying the impact fees today and impact fees being um, used for growth, uh, we actually, you know, when the impact fees that we collect uh, and the percentage that we collect is very small. Is a very small amount and does not pay for a new school or even to uh, to add for additions to new schools to accommodate growth today. Uh, so repaying the debt of schools that were uh, we built a few years ago to meet growth at that time and people who are moving here and living here today and their students attending those schools absolutely meets the rational nexus test and meets every statute and case law for those impact fees and how we utilize those. And that was in that finding, in, in the finding that they, and the recommendation that, you know, when they first came through with that finding and the multiple discussions um, back and forth in stating statute and other school districts and how they utilize spending of those impact fees in the exact same way, really it just came down to we agree to disagree on that. And, you know, if you look at other districts, other districts would agree with our, uh, with our position you know, other districts across the state and have utilized impact fees the same way. I mean, the bottom line is you've got fees that are collected to support growth. Schools are built to support growth of students and st schools are a direct benefit to students not only when they're built but far into the future. Therefore, we still find this to be an acceptable use of impact fees. 
Dr. Atkins, on social media, parents uh, seem to have concerns with uh, finding number eight and number 14. <coughs> Uh, number eight being, uh, you know, people uh, being allowed to come in and out of the school without any background checks. Can you react to that? Well, first and foremost, we take the safety and security of our students. I mean, that's the number one priority for us. Um, I'll let the specifics of that question be answered by, by uh, Mr. Parfit. But when it comes to, you know, any time a, a visitor comes into a building, you know, we do check their credentials and make sure that we've got somebody who who uh, really should be there. So I know that he's, he's delved in that a little bit deeper so he can answer it more specifically. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna move this there. Yeah, a little bit, there, please. No pressure. <laughs> in, in response to that, I, I believe that, you know, we're looking into this, but this, this very likely could just be a record keeping uh, issue that we're dealing with because as Dr. Atkins said we do take that very serious. We have a couple of layers not only is there an application process but visitors are also screened in the schools through uh, a keep and track is one of the systems that we use where it, it uh, scans uh, driver's licenses against the sexual offender and predator database. So we have those systems in place and uh, in, in this case, there were these were volunteers, and, and as I suspect that it's likely uh, a record keeping issue and not necessarily uh, that they were not scanned, and that's something that we'll, we, we, we will look into uh, moving forward. But do you believe the background checks are taking place at other schools? I mean, they chose one and found, I believe, nine uh, that don't have any indication that there was a background check. Yes, I, I do believe they are, and uh, we've we've even added those that those systems. For example, we've we've purchased additional keep and track systems for use in our schools that are shelters. So when when we open a school up for a, an emergency evacuation shelter, we're screening those individuals also. So yes, I do believe that we are. Uh, we are doing that. You know, Just to harp on that one more time, parents are already concerned that there are people without recorded paperwork walking through their child's school. Is the school district putting kids at risk? No, no. And, and again, I think that, that, again, because of the audit findings that there were nine uh, applications that couldn't be found, the individuals were not sexual offenders or predators. And that's why I suspect, and it's something we're going to look into, but no, we take that very serious. Uh, no matter whether they're an employee and, and the background checks that they go through or a visitor. Who would bear the responsibility for that missing paperwork if that's the case? Well, the, the applications are filed and handled by the school administrator at, at that site. Uh, and they ultimately are the ones to sign off on, on volunteers. So the principal? Yes. And one of the things you have to keep in mind too is since this uh, since this audit and actually uh, since the tragedy at Parkland, you know, we have really um, taken our security to a whole different level. One of the things that Mr. Parfit has done is he's put together literally uh, security teams, safety and security teams that go out to our buildings and do spot checks to make sure that they are following proper protocols, safety and security protocols. So this is something that's regular, it's ongoing, it's something that we've never seen in the past, but it also helps us to assure our parents and community that we do uh, everything we can to keep our schools safer than they've ever been. And I, I'll want to add to that real quickly. And the, one of the things that's also important to note is this was an audit of our fiscal year 2017. So 2016, 2017 is the time that they were looking at, and we're in October of 2018. So Parkland happened, happened after this fact, and a lot of these original find that being one of the original findings uh, when we went through that and looking through a lot of improvements uh, in our responses to those original findings, we've already been well into and have, uh, have in place as well too. So it just goes to speak that it is very serious. We take it very seriously and have already implemented processes uh, and even done uh, you know, background and t to seeing if it was just record keeping or, or what the situation was. Um, and it was the three, the first three findings, which were the findings that came out 
once all of this had been gone through and we all agreed or, or took exception to some of the original findings. So 1617, 2016, 2017 was the window of time that this audit uh, looked at. And so you believe it was an isolated case? Is Correct, what you're exactly. And then as far as finding 14, the number of uh, folks, uh, IT users, who had access to things like student social security numbers, did that come as a surprise? What steps have you taken to, uh, to, to minimize that risk? I think that particular one, um, I don't, don't believe that one was a surprise. And one of the things that we have to look at is, uh, you know, auditors have certain opinions about, about some, of the, uh, uh, some of the recommendations that they make, and we don't always necessarily agree with them. Uh, you have to look at, um, you know, safety and security, obviously, but you're also are looking at uh, running an efficient operation of a school district and the people that, that do have access are people that we have screened as a district and we deem uh, to be uh, acceptable in terms of having access to that data. I mean, some of the protocols that they do recommend, and you have to do balance, you know, part of this is a efficiency in operation versus what they want to see in terms of what they recommend as a best practice protocol, and then we have to weigh and make the best decision that we can. I mean, at the end, they're recommendations. And I, I have a statement from the IT department to give to you related to that, that finding. So have you limited the number of people who have access? We, yes, yes. You're, you're asking taxpayers uh, to, to uh, you know, put up more money for schools uh, in November. Uh, a state representative uh, tweeted uh, just today that uh, how can we trust them to do this? Are you concerned that this audit and others that have come out put that in jeopardy? Well, again, I, I, as I said before, I think the timing of this particular audit is, is, uh, is you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's coming, appearing when it's appearing. Uh, I do find it also interesting that all of our other audits that have recently come in, including the APAGA audit, that was specifically put there, I think, as, a, as an obstacle for Lee County to be able to, to um, get its referendum on the ballot, that came across as a, an exceptionally good audit. Uh, all of our other previous audits have been exceptionally good audits, uh, financial audits have been clean for over a decade. Our OPAGA audit, even our Gibson efficiency audit that we did ourselves had positive results. And what's even more interesting to me is this audit. When it first came out in October, the auditor themselves, both of them, said, you know, this is, our school district is one of the best in the state when it comes to operational efficiency and operational audit. And then all this stuff happened afterwards. So in terms of, of you know, try, uh, if I was a taxpayer, I'm looking at the, the history of the school district in terms of how it's managed its money, and I think I can be pretty confident looking at a good track record of this school district in terms of how it handles operations, how it handles its finances. And we have audit after audit after audit to, to demonstrate that. And then this particular one, we have some differences of opinion. But again, what's interesting, like if you take the finding on impact fees, attorneys across the state and other school districts and our attorneys overwhelmingly agree with our position. We have one attorney in the auditor's office that disagrees with this decision. One, case law does not support his position case law supports our position, therefore we take exception with, with his opinion. When you guys are saying the timing's interesting, not a coincidence, I just want to be like completely clear here. Who would have the motivation to try to sabotage a sales tax referendum? I think we all can ask, you know, we can answer that question for ourselves. I mean, we, all I could give you is opinion, and I'm not going to do that here, but uh, again, I don't find this to be just a simple coincidence. This is something that, sh that originally the exit audit was in October, and then we have a date in March where this should have been delivered to us, and here we are at the end of September, and we're going to get this, it's out there right now, you know, a month before we're putting a referendum on the ballot. I'll just walk us quickly through a, a real quick timeline. So October 2017 is when we had our original exit conference with uh, the, the auditors. 
um, and everything that Dr. Atkins said in the conversation and the findings and, and going forward. And we were expecting uh, what they call a PNT, a preliminary and tentative finding report from the Auditor General, which they give us 30 days to reply and respond whether we agree or disagree and provide our, our, our facts and information stating why we agree or disagree and what we're going to be doing uh, in relation to those findings. And that was to come out in March. You know, we did go out and vote to, uh, for the sales tax referendum to be placed on the general election ballot for no this November, right around that same time. Uh, we submitted our responses and we're waiting for the auditor's um, finalization of this overall audit to be done with those findings, not findings one, two, three, and four. Uh, and then it was the anonymous phone calls to the auditor general's office. And then it was, you know, hey, by the, we were calling to say, you know, is our audit finalized? Can we go? Well, it's an opportunity. We want to look into some of these other areas. Your, your operational audit is still open and it unraveled from there. So from March all the way up to the end of July, um, all of, all of the, everything that we've talked about has come uh, from that. I just want to be like concise <clears throat> again. So you're insinuating that these anonymous phone calls resulted in the extra findings? Well, the, the anonymous phone calls uh, were related to uh, our indoor air quality and looking at you know, how we do that. And it started out as a, as a, um, originally as a fraud you know, hey, I think there's things that are going on there, and that was quickly uh, um, uh, found not to be true, the Auditor General and our own internal audit department. Um, but then that was uh, an opportunity to look at the internal controls of our, uh, of our maintenance department as it relates to indoor air quality, which we provided substantial information uh, of, you know, how we manage that process and how we pay for that process and the vendors that we utilize to go in for mold remediation, keeping in mind we just went through Hurricane Irma, massive flooding, roofing, uh, roof leaks, uh, and so, you know, all of that being considered, it was still, it was, an, it was a, a very circular conversation going back and forth as the information that we're providing not being sufficient enough for them to remove that finding. Again, it was, we'll agree to disagree on that. When it comes to that $13.6 million and the vote coming up in November, mm -hmm. some people are wondering how can taxpayers trust the school district to spend that sales tax properly if it does go through in November? We spent that $13.6 million in impact fees the proper way. And we will spend any sales tax revenue that we receive absolutely the proper way. We will even have an independent oversight committee that will be reviewing all our sales tax revenue, how we are appropriating for it, appropriating how we're going to be spending that sales tax revenue. Uh, and our own team here, uh, there's multiple divisions and departments that will be utilizing that sales tax revenue, whether we're building new schools, whether uh, it goes to safety and security, technology, the maintaining of our schools, uh, you know, the impact fees and that $13.6 million was spent according to statute, according to case law, sales tax revenue, you can be assured it will be spent the proper way. I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, what I would like is for community members, taxpayers to be informed. And, and I think we all need to be transparent, but we also need to do our homework. So I would encourage people to, to go online and read our audits, read our budget, <coughs> ask questions. Um, what, that's why we put those things out there. What I would discourage people from doing is taking the sound bites or tweets from people and making decisions based on those simple headlines. This is something that requires a lot of work, a lot of in-depth reading to, to totally understand, but I would encourage people always to be informed uh, before you make your decisions. That's really all I would ask. And I'll, I'll add even further to that. The one audit that we did go through this summer, the OPAGA audit, was a direct result of us going for the sales tax referendum. That was new legislation that was passed. And the sole purpose of that audit was to look at the areas that will be utilizing the sales tax revenue and whether or not we are currently effective and efficient in the, in the way that we operate and utilize our current funding. And that independent audit came back as a very favorable audit and that we are effective and efficient in the way that we operate, especially as we will utilize those capital dollars, impact fees being those as well. So that's, you know, as we're talking about the timing and, and, and the, how this audit was so different than anything else we've ever gone through, that's also some of the background and context to it. So, sorry to go over this again. So it started because of finding number three and then they decided to go into all these other topics on their own. Correct. Okay. Um, what are you guys going to change after this? What changes can we expect? 
Well, there's already been, I think, a, a lot of changes that we have made as a, as a school district in response to a lot of things that you'll find on, on this audit, uh, not just as a result of the audit, but things that we've been doing prior to, um, you know, this outcome. I think Mr. Parfit mentioned many things that are going on in safety and security that are making our schools much, much safer than they've ever been before. We practically have all of them down to a single point of entry. Uh, at this point, we are uh, down the road quite a bit with our red lock program and also improvements in, in surveillance. When it comes to our budgeting practices, uh, I think they are better than we've ever had. Uh, we've had a, a really strong budget team over the years, but uh, we now have um, you know, new leadership and I think new direction. We're going to become even more efficient with our budget, even, even despite the fact that we've had really good outcomes previously. Is there anything that did jump out to you from this audit that you guys feel like you want to own up to and really improve? I mean, most of the, the findings after the first four were ones that we were aware of and have been working through, you know, all the way to almost a year ago. Um, and in those you'll see we either um, take, you know, said we agree in, in part with these findings and are doing these things and our recommendations at the end of that are what we will be doing going forward to, uh, to improve upon those. So that's in the report. Um, as far as the other three findings, I mean, as I said again, it was multiple conversations with the auditor and the auditor, auditor general herself and just really understanding their viewpoint, stating our viewpoint and agreeing to disagree. Just to backtrack really quickly to finding 14 where we were talking about those social security numbers, your response in the report says that you are, quote, in the process of implementing a periodic review process, but you're saying today that that's done and the only people who are looking at student social security mm -hmm. numbers are the ones you're supposed to be. Is that correct? And we've been in that process, and, uh, and Rob uh, also has the, uh, the statement from our, uh, our CIO, Trey Davis, on that as well. Do you overall think this is a damning report? And again, are you concerned that it could have an impact on the result of the, uh, the, 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 the tax? I don't really consider it to be, um, quote, damning. Uh, I, because if you really get in there and read the findings and then read responses to those findings, I think that, that you'll, you would be comfortable with the outcomes. I do, um, I'll be, you know, candid that I am concerned about the timing of this and when it lands and people paying attention to headlines that could change opinions <coughs> rather than really getting the facts. What do you want the final message to be to people who are going to see this tonight and, and see some of those um, concerning uh, reports? The final message would be, as, I, as I've said all through this uh, whole referendum process, I want our community to be informed, I want our community to get the facts, and I would encourage them to, to delve deep and to do just that, to be an informed uh, consumer and informed uh, taxpayer. Did any positive come out of this, in your opinion, that um, you guys are going to take away and feel good about, that you can put in your tool belt or whatever it may be? I think there's a lot of a lot of positives, honestly. With you know, you go through something like this, and you know, the purpose of an audit is to make us better, and that's the way I typically approach these. Is is I want to see what they have to say. I think this uh, caused us to do a deep examination of our own processes and 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 make improvements uh, as it relates to the budget process, as it relates to safety and security, as it relates to uh, technology and our protocols there. So um, despite all of this, you know, audits typically give an organization opportunity to reflect and make improvements, which is what we've done. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.